everybody. Welcome to vodcast number two in our molecular genetics unit. Um, in this one, we're going to look at the structure of DNA and follow it up with how DNA replicates itself. So without further ado. So the Watson and Crick model of DNA. At this point, we now know that DNA is the molecule of heredity, and it's thanks to James Watson, Francis Crick, Marius Wilkins, Rosalind Franklin, and all of their work that helped to determine the actual molecular structure of DNA. And on April 23rd, 1953, that is when that paper was published. So this April, um, maybe we'll celebrate DNA Day. So we've talked a little bit about this in class already, so I'm gonna kinda just roll right through it, but feel free to pause it, stop it, go back anytime if you're feeling a little uncertain about it. Um, so as we know, there are the components of DNA. They are nucleic acids, and their subunits are monomers of nucleotides, which are made up of three things. We have the five carbon sugar, which is deoxyribose in the case of DNA, the phosphate group, your PO4. Now due to this and the additional oxygen here, this is going to give DNA an actual negative charge, which is going to be very important down the road in our biotechnology that we talk about um, and the fact that DNA is a negatively charged molecule. It also has a nitrogen base, and of which for DNA there are four, and we have adenine, guanine, thymine, and cytosine. Now adenine and guanine, those are our purines, thymine and cytosine are the um, pyrimidines. So purines, adenine, and guanine. And here's the neat thing, a purine always binds to a pyrimidine. Mentioned double ring structure. So here we have the octet rule. Um, so just reminding ourselves um, on covalent bonding. So if you need to go back to remind yourself of that, all of these molecules are bonded covalently, creating a very, very strong bond with all of the pieces of our nucleotide. Um, it's what actually holds the double ring, or the double strand together that's held together by hydrogen bonds. Our pyrimidines, thymine and cytosine, remembering the why, 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 will help you remember which one's which. So our base pairing rules. Thanks to Erwin Shargaff um, in the 1950s, uh, he found that there's a proportionate amount of adenine to thymine in all DNA and a proportionate amount of guanine to cytosine. So this told us that in the double um, helix, adenine will always pair with thymine, guanine will always pair with cytosine. So Watson and Crick had heard about this and actually used it to help them predict their model of the idea of the double helix. That in association with Rosalind Franklin's very famous x-ray of the DNA, that crisscross pattern um, showed that it was a two-stranded molecule actually twisting in this helix. And actually this past December we've had the first um, the closest photograph that we've ever had of the DNA molecule showing the actual helix structure. So I'll have that posted for you guys on the website. So a little detail about our model, which we call the Watson and Crick model. Okay, the strands are oriented in what we call anti-parallel. And what that means is one side runs upright in that five prime to three prime direction. Okay, so we've got one side that has the carbons of the sugar running in the five prime to three prime direction. And that is hydrogenly bonded to the other side of the molecule, but the other side runs in the three prime to five prime direction. So one side's right side up, the other side's upside, head, uh, upside down. And you notice that for me, it was always about keeping, you know, which side had the um, house, the oxygen pointing upward. So covalent bonds are what link my nucleotides together, and we do that on the sides of the ladder between the sugar and the phosphate. So you have alternating sugar phosphates that make up the side of your ladder while hydrogen bonds hold the bases together in the center. All right, so those hydrogen bonds, as we remember, very strong collectively, very weak individually, so important when it comes to replication and protein synthesis, um, and that's where they're held. So basically, the weak point of the chain is between the bases, not on the sides. And the order of my base pairs is variable. I could have, you know, and that's what makes one gene different from another. That's what makes one critter different from another. The fact that down one side I might have 
C C G G A T C, which we know then the other side is G G C C T A G. This order, let's say this is a gene, this order might be slightly different in another individual. Maybe this particular base is something different. So the order running up and down can be different from one organism to the next. All right, so let's jump right into DNA replication and how DNA copies itself. So during the S phase of the cell cycle, when the cell's ready to divide, whether it's mitosis or meiosis, the chromosomes replicate. And this means DNA has to copy itself. And in our um, in-class investigation, you're gonna see um, the Meselson-Stahl experiment that showed how DNA does this, that it does it in what we call a semi-conservative method. Um, where you actually have, um, you use the original strand as a template, the two sides build. And I'm gonna show you that in a second. So thanks to a lot of enzymes, the DNA gets unzipped, okay? And it gets unzipped by this lovely enzyme right here, known as helicase. Okay, so that is actually what runs down the middle, breaking the hydrogen bonds. Okay, so that breaks the hydrogen bonds down the center, and the DNA is in essence unzipped. All right, so just take a sec. Now I know that there's a lot going on here. We're gonna work our way through. A short RNA primer sequence is gonna form at the sites to signal for DNA polymerase to attach. Now DNA polymerase, that's the important enzyme. This is the one that's going to attach the correct nucleotides to the actual strand, okay? So the primer sequence kind of sets the stage, gets everything ready for DNA polymerase to come in. It is this entire series of enzymes that work together as this massive enzyme you know, unit and complex to ensure that everything gets put together the right way. Okay, so here's my parent strand, as we call it. The replication fork, that's where DNA, um, where the helicase is running down the middle, right here. Okay, and then we have two sides, okay? You have a side here, the three prime original strand that runs down to the five prime original strand. This side goes in what we call a continuous fashion because DNA must be built in the five prime to three prime direction. For whatever reason, that's the way the enzymes work to adjust it. So because it goes that way, it ends up working its way down the actual molecule itself, attaches on, and sends those enzymes and all of the correct nucleotides down. Now on the other side, which is running in the three prime, the five prime direction, we have to go in the opposite way. So it has to be done in sections as it works from the zip down. And we call these particular fragments that are being built Okazaki fragments. And the nucleotides that build up the whole new molecule itself are coming from the cytoplasm. They're actually located well inside the nucleus and floating around there to be used to actually build that up. All right, so the leading strand is continuously synthesized down in the five prime to three prime direction all the way down. And we have the other side, which is the three prime to five prime side, has to be made kind of backwards. So here, this showcases it all pretty well. All right, my leading strand goes from the break and is built from the break down in this way, okay? Being built in the five prime to three prime direction. The other side is being built from the actual break towards the end, okay? And has to be built in these chunks. So here's one chunk, there's an Okazaki fragment here was another Okazaki fragment. And what you do is you get DNA ligase that comes in to help connect those and make sure that all of the Okazaki fragments are put together perfectly. Notice the extensive use of all of the enzymes that are involved in this complex. And when we look at the actual um, computer synthesis that you guys will see in the, um, you know, in the actual uh, activity that we're gonna do, um, it will actually look very confusing, but, um, and you'll see all of these complexes working, all of them kind of, you know, in this sort of very orchestrated fashion to ensure that DNA gets made and synthesized correctly and in the right 
way because we don't want any mistakes to be made. The last enzyme to the last enzyme to kind of come through is DNA ligase. That's going to make sure all the Okazaki fragments on the lagging strand are put together, um, basically cemented together, so that when it's all said and done here, notice what's being built. New strand, right? That's coming off of this side. I'm going to have a whole new strand coming off of this side so that I get uh, two identical pieces of DNA that have copied themselves. Then we have the proofreaders come in. Then we have the proofreaders come in. Another series of enzymes comes in afterwards, basically running down the length of the newly formed DNA strand to ensure that none of the bases were put in incorrectly, that all of the repairs were made, that everything was linked together. So it's following behind everything and basically proofreading the strand. And then the double helix coil gets restored by the reformation of hydrogen bonds. So we recreate our H bonds. And because we use the original template, um, the original DNA as the template, one side is an original strand, the other side is the new strand. We call this the semi-conservative method of DNA replication. Um, and we can thank Meselson and Stahl for figuring that one out. And one last look. And one last look. Just to point out, here's my leading side. Over here is my lagging. So what we found is that in all living things, the actual structure of DNA is the same for most um, organisms in terms of how it's built and how it's put together, um, which is really neat. The only difference being the order of those base pairs. So because the structure of it is the same, we can do some pretty neat things, like make a bunny glow for us in green by incorporating a gene into it. Um, and we can include different um, genes into different organisms. This is the basis of biotechnology. Because we can take a gene and basically embed it or incorporate it into another genome, all of the machinery is there and it can be read the way that it's supposed to. So this is the foundation for all of a lot of things like making human insulin and a lot of the biotech that we're going to get ourselves into down the road.